up on Cronkite Sports Live. It's big news out of Tempe in terms of the state of the ASU men's basketball team. Find out what Ray Anderson had to say about the team. Top plays are better than ever this week. We've got a bracket full of 16 of them because this is March. Plus, we got a ring of fire that you don't want to miss on some ASU Lax Bros. All that and much, much more right here on Cronkite Sports Live. Welcome into Cronkite Sports Live. I'm Mauricio Casillas. He's Jake Garcia. And Jake, it's been a long time since we've been on your computer screens. And in case our show is your only source of news consumptions, you missed some major worldwide happenings. Yeah, we saw the nation weirdly polarized over the color of a certain dress for oh a my day. Gosh. I, 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 it's got to be black and blue. I disagree wholeheartedly. <laughs> we also saw Will Farrell play in nine positions in a single day here in Arizona and undertake the noble cause of raising money for his charity, Cancer for College. And you know what? Herb Sendek's tenure at ASU was also a noble cause, but since you last saw us, his tenure is now over. But we'll get to that in just one second. The ASU women's basketball team is currently in Greensboro, North Carolina for its Sweet 16 matchup against the two-seeded Florida State Seminoles. Now, Charlie Turner Thorne and company have the chance to qualify for their third ever Elite Eight in school history. Now, joining me now to break down this matchup is WCSN's women's basketball expert, Elaine Wilson. Now, Elaine, it was sort of a tale of two games in, in those first couple of rounds. The first round game against uh, Ohio, you saw a ASU shooting the ball extremely well, one of the best performances of the season. Then all of a sudden against UALR, they could not make a single shot. Right. So how does that how, how does that make you feel going into this game for the, for the Sun Devils? Well, the way I compare it is that the first game against Ohio was a lot like their non-conference schedule. It was pedal to the metal quickly. They created big leads and big runs, and they were able to bring in their bench and have quite an easy game, a complete game for them as well. When it comes to the UALR game, that's more like Pac-12 play that they've been seeing, where they have some inconsistencies in the first half, and then they come back and they have to, you know, uh, throw the first punch and be able to come back in those games. So I'm a little worried seeing that this far down the stretch just because they're going to be playing harder teams as they go along in the tournament and I'm not sure if it's going to be able to hold up against Florida State. Now looking at that number two matchup against Florida State I thought it was noteworthy Elaine that UALR really should should have won that game against ASU in the second round but they didn't the Sun Devils found a way to come back but there were certainly some things that UALR was able to um, sort of uh, explore and, and, yeah. and show off for the Sun Devils. Now how, did you, how does that play into the ASU playing against the Seminoles? Well, it's really important because ASU needs to find some good looks with Katie Hempen, but I think the really important stat on this is Florida State holding opponents to 56.4 points a game. If ASU is going to have an inconsistent first half like they have been having in the past, they're not going to be able to overcome what Florida State's defense is looking like because they do have a really strong defense. Now, ASU also has that strong defense, but again, it's all about keeping that first half and keeping a complete game for the Sun Devils, so post players like Sophie Brunner are going to really have to step up. They've got a huge guard who's 6'4", uh, a Canadian superstar, and there's a possibility that Quinn Dornstadter or Ayanna Edwards, who match her height, are going to be put up against her because Promise and Mukamara at 5'8 is a little undersized, and they would usually like to have her going up against those big power guards, but that's probably not going to happen today, so it's going to be interesting to see how the bench steps up in this game and whether or not they're going to make it to the Elite Eight. Well, like we said, the Sweet 16 game is tonight on ESPN2, and Elaine, with the very latest on the Sweet 16 matchup. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Even with the nation's fifth toughest schedule today, ASU baseball now rests at 15 and seven overall and continues to cement itself as a top 10 team in the country. A vast majority of the stars have shined brightly for this team. Trevor Allen is on a 16 game hitting streak and is scorching at a 435 average in conference play. Ryan Kellogg is coming off a complete game three hitter against number 15 Oregon. And Ryan Burr, well, as Tracy Smith put it, he's a moose. Eight saves, 4-0, and still hasn't allowed an earned run this year. On the flip side, though, as with any season, there have been some surprises, some good, some bad. And now I welcome in Pac-12 digital play-by-play -play man Dominic Catronio to discuss some of these surprises. Dom, we started the season uh, with the philosophy that this team was going to be built on its pitching staff. Ryan Kellogg's been cash, but it's been Seth Martinez who's really vaulted up into that ace role. There were some voices in the beginning of the season that say put Seth Martinez on the weekend, make sure he can pitch in that kind of a rotation going into next year because he's going to be your ace. But now he's already cemented Friday night, and you look at what Ryan Kellogg did in his freshman year, he cemented Saturday night, and their parallels not don't just start there. 16 or excuse me, 12 starts in their career to this point. Pretty similar numbers. Kellogg 
is known to go pretty deep into innings as well. Martinez is more of a strikeout guy. That's why you see a pretty good number in fewer innings. The ERA is a little misleading because Martinez, quite frankly, has faced better opponents outside of, of conference play. He had two midweek games against U of A as his first two starts. That's always difficult. He gave up a lot of runs in those games as well. But Martinez is really off to a great start. Pretty close to Kellogg and somebody that ASU can look forward to in, in the future. Yeah, Seth Martinez sets the tone for the entire weekend, delivering the first pitch each and every Friday. And at his best, Johnny Seawald, the leadoff hitter, does the same atop the lineup. But the problem is Johnny Seawald's been scuffling as of late. He's still getting on base, but he's not hitting for any power, and the strikeouts are starting to pile up. He is tied for the lead, actually, in strikeouts right now on the team with 15 of them. Also, his four for his last 28 in these games recently for ASU. That's not very good for me, leadoff guy. His on-base percentage has dipped below 400. His his average is below 270 as well, but talking to him at practice yesterday, he said he's not worried about it. He knows he's in a slump. The team knows he's in a slump, but he's just going to respect the process, make sure that everything is good in his mechanics, and the pits will eventually fall. He's been robbed a couple of times, too. He's hit the ball hard, just hasn't found the gaps yet, obviously. And he's also talked about how the new hit-by-pitch rule might have affected his game plan a little bit because he likes to crowd the plate, make the pitchers uncomfortable, but now he can't lean into those inside pitches, and it's suddenly he's not on base anymore as much, and... People just know about him. They know that he's going to crowd that plate. It's his third year. He's not a secret anymore what Johnny Seawall does, but he'll get it going. ASU welcomes in Stanford for a three-game set this weekend, and perhaps Perhaps for Seawald, it's music to his ears. He's three for three against Stanford's Friday night starter, Brett Hanowich. We'll see if he can get things going tonight and for the rest of the series. Dom, thanks for joining us. Mal, back to you. As you mentioned earlier, ASU is currently searching for a new men's basketball coach. After nine seasons at the helm for the Sun Devils, Herb Sendek was fired by athletic director Ray Anderson. Two, turn appear two tournament appearances simply was not enough, and Anderson says he wants a coach that can come in, recruit, and consistently get results. Two names that are being thrown out right now are Duke assistant Jeff Capel and Memphis head coach Josh Passner. However, the school said it, has, it will not comment on the search until a coach is found. Aspiration uh, to also provide a frontline uh, basketball game day experience, very frankly, the way we're going to end up with our football reinvention. And for more on the coaching search, we bring in men's hoops expert Zach Pocalib. Now, Zach, we mentioned the two guys earlier, mm -hmm. Jeff Capel and Josh Passner. Yep. What are the keys to this head coaching search for ASU? Well, Ray Anderson said he wants a culture change at ASU. He really wants a, a, maybe a, a more energetic coach and one that can be uh, effective on the recruiting trail. And so that's why Jeff Capel and Josh Passner have been the two popular names being thrown around. Both guys are young. Both guys have been uh, really have made really big uh, hits on the recruiting trail. I mean, Jeff Capel brought in Blake Griffin to Oklahoma, and then Josh Passner just consistently brought in players to Memphis. But two other names that are being thrown around recently, um, Bobby Hurley at, at Buffalo, and then Steve Lavin just got let go today mm -hmm. at St. John's. And so with Jerry Colangelo involved in this process as well, those are also some names. They're a little older, mm -hmm. but they're more established and, and more uh, certain as far as their, their ability to coach a team and not just recruit. Certainly, but Zach, something that I think people might be a little surprised at is if you look historically at this ASU men's basketball program, Herb Sendik is one of the top coaches yeah. for ever in this program, and so do you think people were surprised that he was let go? I don't think they were surprised, but the reactions were all the same when Herb Sendik was let go. It was, they felt bad for Sendik, he's a well-respected man, but he wasn't getting the job done. Middle of the Pac-12 wasn't going to be a good enough finish for Ray Anderson. Two tournament appearances in nine years is solid, but he, Ray Anderson wants great. Uh, the the uh, culture around Arizona State basketball has just been this ho-hum, middle of the pack, uh, mid-table type of thing. And, and Sunday, or, uh, Ray Anderson rather really wants that to change. He really wants to energize his fan base, and so I think that's why he had to make that change. And now, Zach, in terms of the roster, Herb Sendik and his assistants were the guys that brought all these players mm -hmm. into, in, into Tempe right now. How's the roster looking? Who's staying? Who's going? And how about recruits? How's that looking? Well, as far as recruits, uh, they've received some decommitments from ben Brendan Bailey in the 2016 class and then uh, Marcus Howard in the 2017 class, but he did that before Sendek was fired. But that being said, as far as the roster on the team right now, Connor McDougal is rumored to transfer before the season had ended. He's put the re to rest those rumors. He's going to wait and see. Uh, same with Trey Holder, and that's the really important one. Trey Holder was on fire at the end of that season. So if he stays, that's big for whoever the next coach is. As well as Savon Goodman, he's staying as well. If he were to transfer, he's already used his redshirt season, so he's going to stay as a Sun Devil. Um, as far as the core, there really hasn't been much else uh, to be said. But that being said, um, each guy in this roster really enjoyed Sendek and his staff. So again, it'll be up in the air. and. A lot of it will happen probably afterward, after the new hire is made. 
Yeah, Zach, you figure if this core group of a uh, core group of players mm -hmm. is able to stay, whichever coach comes in should be able to have some success. Yep. But again, we thank you, Zach, for your for the latest on the head coaching. Okay. There's a prodigious strength in sorrow and despair. The sorrow and despair aspect for the ASU gymnastics team was a miserable 2015 season. Battling injuries to key contributors after already having depth issues and having to mold to a first year head coach, the Sun Devils dropped six of their eight matches this season. The team also took last place in one tri-meet and last place in both of its quad meets it competed in, including the Pac-12 championships last Saturday in Salt Lake City. The prodigious strength, though, is that despite all these collective struggles, ASU will still be represented at the regional tournament. Thanks to the individual talents of two members, senior Natasha Sunby, who qualified to compete in the floor exercise, and junior Taylor Alex will be partaking in the all-around competition. The tournament will be held on April 4th in Norman, Oklahoma, and since ASU did not qualify as a team for the tournament, Sunby and Alex will need to win their respective competitions in order to advance to the national tournament. Jake, there's the number 21 ranked so softball like, team. They're heading down really to Arizona happy. for this, and there's pitcher Brianna Maha. He's talking about getting the start there for the Sun Devils. Now, it's, it's, in those rivalry games, it's difficult. Some t it's not difficult for players to get motivation and get ready, and that's exactly what this Sun Devil squad has been talking about. <laughs> Boyfriend's on the baseball team there, but she cannot stand field day, so she's really pumped about it. And I'm really upset because we cannot, we have a wildcat, like stuffed animal that usually like hangs in our locker room, and we can't find him, so we're kind of freaking out, but we'll find him. And now the Sun Devils and Wildcats will square off at 5 p.m., and you can catch all that weekend action on the Pac 12 networks. Now, Jake, switching gears a little bit to our social media segment, we bring in our very own social media expert. It's Gavin Shaw. Now, I'm not sure why he's the only one that we call our social media expert since he's only got 244 followers, but we love him anyway. Gavin, what do you got for us? I was a little harsh. In, <laughs> <laughs> it seems like every single year March Madness is described in hyperbolic terms to the point that it starts to sound a lot like a Greek epic and a lot less like a basketball game. Do or die, one shining moment, giant killer. Ultimately, these are, as the NCAA so readily assures us, just non-professional, unpaid athletes playing basketball purely for the love of the game. There's no need for all the dramatics. Social media captures the lighter side of the tournament and occasionally its most cringeworthy moments. Let's get into them. It's time for your Cronkite Sports Live Tweets of the Week. Psych, that was a fake out. Much like, Mark, wow. much like with Mark Sanchez on Not Top Plays, we always start with Tracy Smith on the show. <laughs> I like it. And guys, Smith right here, he is telling you how to spell win. Are you guys okay with his interpretation of the word? I'm gonna say loose interpretation. You know what, really, Gavin, I'm more impressed with the fact that he was able to use that only in 140 characters. It kind of seemed like it was 170 characters, Jake, but to get that all into 140 characters, impressive by Skip. I think Tracy Smith just seems to have a way with words because I, he described exactly what a win means. It's Ryan Kellogg. All this oh, did, dude is, it does is pump out eight innings of work. He doesn't lose even to the best teams in college baseball, but don't let the title of that graphic go unnoticed. Kellogg is also a brand of cereal. Wow, yes, it certainly is. Valid point, Jake. Guys, I know Smith is considered a baseball genius, but what does it all mean if he doesn't even know how to spell? Wow. And now True. we're going to go back to our primary topic here, Arizona State women's basketball. Here is the Sun Devils' star defensive player, Promise Mukamara, getting flat out assaulted by UALR's Taylor Galt. Guys, foul, red card, what's the call here? Well, this lady who tweeted it seems to think that she deserves to be ejected, but Gavin, I'm going to flip this question back on you. Ooh. Where did you find this tweet, and who was the person who tweeted it? Who's Thomas Mukamara retweeted it, and the wow. person who tweeted it is an Arizona State fan and somehow involved in the program in a way I don't know because Twitter bios are very short, Jake. <laughs> Good stuff from Jan Stevens. I mean, just the fact that fans are taking the time to look at the film, go through that and just get ready for the next game is huge for fans across across the platform. Guys, according to Wikipedia, the definition of a flagrant foul is excessive contact during a live ball situation. Since this was a simple elbow to the eye, I think we're all square here. <laughs> Let's go on to our final Arizona State tweet. It turns out the women's basketball team took the definition of dancing very, very literally. Let's check it out. Okay. Now watch me whip, oh, wow. Whip, watch me nay -nay. Looks like they're getting the whip. A little uh, nay -nay. And then nay, -nay action at the end. I, I learned that. Okay. Wow. I didn't know that before. Wait, Gavin, you're saying you didn't dance to that in your bar mitzvah? Um, <laughs> it, was, it was more of the older crowd that mm -hmm. was nay-naying. 
I'll tell you what, no, Jake is probably one of the worst dancers I've ever seen. That's but Jake, true. that seems like a simple dance that you could learn. I, I'm pretty sure I got compliments over the weekend about my dancing skills. I would fit right in on that women's basketball team. Okay. Let right. me tell you though, that team has some serious swag, and don't don't let it fool you. Katie Hempen's probably leading the charge. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. She's the emotional leader, for sure. Guys, I actually practiced the name and was going to perform it on the show, but we got the focus group results back. And it turns out Cronkite Sports Live would be permanently shut down if I attempted to perform the Nene. So I'm going to restrain myself, and hopefully Arizona State figures out a way to keep dancing. That's it for me. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. Thank you very much, Gavin. You inspire me each and every day or every show to be better and strengthen <laughs> my knowledge at pop culture. And now to another pop culture-based segment. Troy Lynch has Ring of Fire with the ASU Lax team. Probably Catwoman. 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 I don't know, Catwoman. I don't know. <laughs> the frog. The frog makes me laugh. The emoji, uh, frowny face. The what? Poop face. <laughs> Can you make the face? Um, I don't know, it's just smile and poop. <laughs> I put a cup in, because everyone, were, uh, I had to put in cups. And I didn't have like an actual jock strap, so I just put the cup in, tried tried running around, and uh, midway through running, the cup just falls onto the middle of the field. So the ref as they ends up like having to pick it up and run off the field with it with my cup. <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Troy. It's much appreciated. Now, I said at the start of the show that this is March, and the one thing that is. describes March a little bit better than anything else is the implementation of a bracket. Mm -hmm. And so now, basing myself off that and Cronkite Sports Live, everyone here, we've assembled a bracket of the top 16 plays that we've seen this year. We're gonna show you exactly what that looks like right here. Remember, our graphics people are better than yours. So taking a look at this, <laughs> There, it's arranged into groups of four, one through four seeds in each region. There's no top overall seed, and today we're going to be highlighting two interesting matchups. You can cast your vote on our social media site on Twitter. The results will be announced on next week's show with Brett and Jason. You can see club sports in the upper left, Olympic sports in the lower left, on the field, which is baseball and softball in the upper right, and a women's world in the lower right. So women's sports getting a section of the bracket to their own. Now, like I said, we're going to be starting it off by highlighting two matchups, and we'll take a look at this first play with the following highlight. Let's do it. Game three in the Olympic sports region. This is the number three seed. Josh De Silvera, four legs good, two legs bad. Pins Matt Williams of Bakersfield and goes on to take the 197 pound match. And then we got another one here. It's ASU gymnast Natasha Sunby with this unbelievable routine. Scores an incredible score. And you know what, Jake? You mentioned it earlier. Sunby will be representing ASU at regionals. And next one coming up, we got Colby Woodmanzi, one of the best plays. If this doesn't win, I'm going to be really upset at our producers. Goes down to left field over the fence against Oklahoma State. Jake, an incredible play, the best way to christen Phoenix Muni. If you ask me, this next play got robbed. This is the four seed. Having to go up against walk-off Woody, don't sleep on this play, though. Crush into the right center gap, but Johnny Seawald. The coaches see that. Rob Skalg of extra bases. Johnny Seawald flashing some leather. That was incredible. And you know what? This leads us perfectly into our next segment. It's now we have some potential future top plays coming up. And our very, old Joe, our very own Joe Constantine is here to help us plan out your weekend with all the key Sun Devil matchups coming up. Joe, what do you have for us? Thanks, guys. And as some of you know, Zayn Malik has recently left the band One Direction to go a new direction. Joining him is Herb Sendek and the ASU gymnastics team. But there are teams that win at Arizona State, and you can catch one of them tonight. The women's basketball team has landed themselves in the Sweet 16 and takes on the Florida State Seminoles tonight at 6.30, and no, crab legs are not on the menu. If sitting in the sun for extended periods of time is your thing, then you can catch the Pac-12 versus Big Ten track meet at Sun Angel Stadium all day. And if you head over to Phoenix Muni Stadium at 6.30 tonight, you can catch a Sun Devil baseball team opening their series against Stanford. As you take a look at Saturday, 
Head caps are coming back into style, and you can see them in their entirety at 5 o'clock as ASU takes on Hardwick in water polo. You can also make your way down to one of Arizona's finest beaches as sand volleyball takes on New Mexico at 5. And we look at Sunday, baseball wraps up their series against Stanford at 12.30 p.m. at Phoenix Mini. And softball takes on Arizona down in the dirty tee. An actual, for an actual weekend forecast, we highly suggest you download the Weather Channel app. And that's all I have for you guys. Back to you. Thank you, Joe. Mal, I'm sure you couldn't tell, but that was actually Joe's first time on CSL. I loved it. He was great. But Absolutely. we're going to now go to the Money Maker segment of the show. You've seen it before, but in case you forgot, this is the way it is. We're going to bounce a few questions off each other, three of them to be precise, and then the winner will get a FaceTime rant in my case, and I'm not sure what mm, Mal has in store. Let's just wait. Let's just wait. We'll see what's in store. So I'll start things off with the first question. We led the show off with it, and we'll now lead this segment off with it. The ASU women's basketball team is the most notorious team ASU has to offer at the moment, and Charlie Turner Thorne and her post-game presser <laughs> After its first round tournament win, she alluded to the movie Elf. She loves saying, Christmas. Yeah, exactly. Saying all her team does is believe. Now, if her team can pull off the upset against second seed Florida State, what movie reference does she have up her sleeve this time? You know what, Jake? It took me a lot of time to come up with this, but really it didn't take me a lot of time at all. Because <laughs> watching that game against UALR, they had no shot. But now you know what they have? A new hope. Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. But what this implies is that Florida State's head coach is actually Darth Vader, which is not what I'm trying to say. Now switching gears, Jake, is it a good or bad move that Tracy Smith called out his players on social media? Tracy Smith telling it like it is is what makes him a special coach. He pushes this team to the highest of standards and demands nothing short of perfection. This is why this team has jumped all the way up to number six in the college baseball poll. I have absolutely no problem with it. Now to more coaching news. Herb Sendek, we talked about it earlier, mm -hmm. he's gone. There's now a head coaching vacancy. Who is your top candidate to assume this role as ASU men's basketball coach? You know, I like what Zach Pocklip said earlier about Jeff Capel. He's a guy that has experience at Oklahoma at VCU you look at what VCU is doing right now an incredible program and that's something that he set the stepping stones for he brought in Blake Griffin everyone loves Blake Griffin I think he'd be a refreshing a, a refreshing face and he coached under coach K you can't get much better than better than that Jake now switching gears onto the softball diamond Jake the softball team we mentioned earlier heads to Tucson to take on against take on number 14 U of A now freshman pitchers Brianna Maha and Dale Rendeck are virtually identical in stats it's unbelievable if you hide the pictures you don't you have no idea who it is who emerges as the ace in the future with this team? Well, I would have no problem with anyone making the case for either of them. Rindak's numbers are slightly better at the moment, but I'm going to go with Brianna Maha. If she allows fewer home runs and issues fewer walks, her stuff is electric. She's going to rack up strikeouts in bunches for this ASU softball team. Now, ASU Lax dropped from number two to number four in the MCLA rankings, and they didn't even play a game. Is the MCLA ranking system more whack than the BCS was? You know what, Jake? I think it's a little ridiculous that you drop two spots when you're that high up, but there is absolutely no way that the MCLA rankings are worse than the, the BCS rankings. Think of all the countless great Boise State teams, TCU teams, even Auburn that one year that couldn't play for a national championship. Here in the MCLA, you got a tournament. You can do it in the tournament. That's why it's important. Now, Jake, we love to finish things off here on Cronkite Sports Live with a heartwarming story. AC quarterback Mike Bercovici was out eating uh, with his family at Oregano's, and there's these two little boys sitting next to him. Now they're trying to get the nerve to just talk to Mike Bercovici. Oh, I want to talk to him. Berko hears this because he's got supersonic hearing. Heads over he, to his he's car. He's a PR dream. He's a PR dream. He's unbelievable. He hears this, heads to his car, signs some cleats, gives it to them. Now that's a long windup, Jake, but if you could get one piece of signed equipment from a certain ASU athlete, what would it be? I think I'm going to go with the water polo swim cap of Petra Purdy. <laughs> and I'm going to be honest with you, I've never seen her play. But oh she gosh. is the best Sun Devil athlete okay. that no one has heard about. Okay. Reigning MPSF Player of the Week, coming off her nine-goal performance in the ASU Invitational. Mm -hmm. She's fifth in school history in goals, ninth in assists. Man. She is red hot right you sound, now. You sound like you're a PR release right now. I, I've never seen her play. You don't know who she is. The point is, she's I'm going sure. to get her autograph before she comes famous, and when she does, I'm going to cash it in and strike it rich. Okay, fair enough. Let's see what our producers had to say about this one. Um, oh, yes, oh, it's, it's me, zoom the slow in. zoom no. in. Yes, one to one. All right, guys, look at that horrible picture of me, but I want to get into a topic that we've already mentioned a lot, countless of times on this show. But ASU, uh, I think it's important to bring up exactly what f former head coach Herb Sendek meant to ASU basketball. People are saying that Sendek was trash. They're saying he needed to leave, and those people are simply misguided. If you look at the numbers, it's hard to find a better coach at Arizona State historically than Herb Sendek. Everyone makes a huge deal about how he was as a recruiter, but Sendek was able to bring 
Bring, bring in big guys, Ike Diagu, Jeff Ayers, Carrick Felix, and Jahi Carson, all guys that played pivotal roles in the Pac-12. And people also need to realize how difficult it is to recruit in the state of Arizona when the Wildcats are just down the road. Now, the Wildcats have a much richer tradition and have way better facilities, but couple that together with... Uh, Couple that together, and it's impressive that Herb Sendik was able to put together some solid teams. I understand why Sendik was fired, and I do think it was time to move on for ASU, but please do yourself a favor and research before you go out and spew some hate about a quality coach. There it is, Jake. Well, congratulations. The score is now tied 1-1. I do think I got robbed once again, but we'll determine next week or in two weeks to see who the winner is once again. Well, Jake, that about wraps it up from us here at Cronkite Sports Live. I think it was a great show, especially based off the fact that I was able to win. And we thank all of our crew and cast members for a great show. We're saying so long from our downtown Phoenix studios. He's Jake Garcia. I'm Mauricio Casillas. Thanks for watching.